So just a few announcements to you guys. Um, from next week, the heartbeat going into a um, crazy journey of multi-siding. And we're going to have a first service Saturday night, heartbeat open from next week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I know a lot of you guys here is not you know, anything new. Uh, but you've been praying about this, but this is going to be official that uh, we're going to actually do it like this from next week. We have a morning service in Central Sunday morning and afternoon in Lidcombe Saturday night here. I just uh, passed by and someone says, oh, we have a main service on Sunday. I don't like that. This is a main service. This is a service that a lot of people will be saved. This is a place where people will hear the gospel. This place you can serve, you can grow, you can, you can get married. <laughs> Suddenly you just brighten up. You know, it, this is where you can actually have family. Just think about all sorts of possibility and vision in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And uh, we're trying to build certain characteristics, especially the open church here. So you are not a separate church, so you are feel free to come morning service and afternoon service. Uh, don't be a stranger. If you come to Melbourne, there's a church in Happy, Happy Church there as well. All right, so feel free to just joining in to the greater community. But uh, this, because we're starting up this one, I really want you to really love on each other, right? Um, tonight is a bit more people simply because it's the extension of our event called uh, Shepherd School. Um, we, we started last night. It's going to happen about three times a year and uh, all the leaders should come together and share their hearts and questions and all that stuff happen, right? So uh, tonight is going to be the, this is going to be kind of a last time that you will, some of you guys will hear from uh, Pastor Philip. But if you want to hear more, one more time, come tomorrow at Lakeham service. Uh, you, you will hit, uh, preach different different sermon, right, tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's right. So, okay. Um, anybody new today? Is this the first time in our church? Yay. All right. Let's, uh, can you just stand up? Can we just give a big clap? Uh, who else? Who else? Is anybody new? Oh, stand up. Just stand up. Okay, man. Oh. Everybody see you anyway, right? Good. Right? Okay. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Take a seat. All right. Great. And, uh, um, and I want you to all the open, just understand this is what we're going to do every week, right? So if anybody new come and I introduce them to, to me and pastor and uh, to each other and uh, just really welcome them, yeah? Um, I heard a little bit about you. I don't, I forgot your name, but it's the first time uh, you're going out to reach out to the Muslim people and you're Egyptian as well, right? And you've been in Australia about 12 weeks? Yeah. Two years now. Well, there's big difference. <laughs> right? I've been to Egypt and I fall in love with all the Egyptians that they're beautiful people. Thank you for coming. I know it's a bit in the different environment that your background was a bit different. I know we are a bit loud <laughs> and uh, we, we are better looking though, isn't it? No? Okay, good. <laughs> good to have you here. Now we have a whole bunch of, I can, let me just do a quick survey, right? So how many of you guys under 20 years old? Put your hands up under 20 years old. Oh, wow, look at it. Hey, 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 not <laughs> lie. All right, put your hands down. I can't tell the, what is true or not. So some of you guys are lying. I see your hands, but you don't look under 10 years. How many of you guys are over 40? All right, okay. Right. We shouldn't do this, right? So you can see, as you can see, this is going to be a really, really young church. But can I tell you, although this is young church, we reject the idea that this is going to be immature church. Amen? Amen? This is going to be church so passionate, but yet go deeper in the word of God, a mature church. And I really admire, and I'm a big fan of you, to what you guys are doing out there. You, got a, you guys are amazing, but keep that passion, but yet go deeper, go deeper. And also, maturity means being on it. You are the, you, you're responsible, right? So you run this church. You own this church. You support this church. Um, I think it's going to be an exciting journey from here on. Amen. 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 Right. So I got a, another news I'm going to be share next week. But from next week, we're going to start, start a whole multi-site thing. There are a few things that I, we need to do. I know that some of you guys went out to the, the cleaning up, uh, the, the like weed and all that stuff. You literally killed the whole lawn. Right. I told you to garden, garden things, but you actually killed everything. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we have to put something back in there, right? Uh, we we'll, we'll think of something. Um, and another thing, that, another thing that you have to remember to do is that we have to be very careful cleaning up this place. Yeah, uh, every time we use, every time we finish, you know, we need to sort of stack up in a certain way and then you know, clean up and all that stuff. I'm excited, I'm excited. I like this church already, yeah. All right, okay, I'll, I'll sh better shout out and uh, get the uh, guest speaker today. You know, he's not really guest uh, for me, personal uh, friend and also mental figure. And uh, he's been such a generous man and pastor and doctor. He's a medical doctor and slash senior pastor of a large church in Malaysia. Um, yeah, he's uh, actually the Oxford graduate. Mm. This, it's all right, not that bad. <laughs> Just, yeah, that's right. We, I'm UTS. <laughs> um, but, and, tape, tape, yeah, right. High school graduate. Some people didn't even graduate yet, right? So, uh, this is awesome. Um, and uh, he's been supporting this church from day one. So he came for our the first service of our bid and be a great blessing. Since then, he's been supporting us financially even. Uh, he prayed for us. And so I feel like uh, so like, uh, I feel like I have a big brother somewhere, you know? And I can always, if you hurt me, I can go to me, you know, things like that, right? So, and, and uh, he came here uh, just to bless you and to just love on you. And he's got a great insight, great uh, uh, the gifting in the sermon, the message, and you know, all these stories, the testimony, all that stuff. Um, I don't know what he's going to talk about tonight, but and, um, let's receive it. Amen? Amen. The greatest, greatest uh, attitude right now is that this heart of a uh, recipient heart, the open heart, right? When you hear the sermon, right? Even the worst preacher sitting here, you can just hear the G word of Jesus. You're going, Amen! And you get something out of it. Amen? Amen. And uh, so, let's uh, give it up for our pastor, Pastor Philip Lin. <laughs> Well, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. It's good to be here and seeing Sky uh, Heartbeat just continuing to grow. And uh, I'm really blessed. Forget about the Oxford bit, okay? I am just an ox for Jesus. That's all it is, okay? <laughs> so uh, I'm here, you know, I don't know how many of you, you know, I, I was just in Perth, just uh, the whole of last week, just teaching a leadership to a whole group of, of, of young people. And most of them were under 20. And that's why I like to hang around young people like your pastor. Okay, because, uh, because uh, when I hang around people like him and people like yourselves, I feel young all over again. Amen. Because after all, at the end of the day, age is only a number. Amen. True? Amen. See, your, your pastor has a biggest amen to that. Age is only a number. So I tell everybody that, you know, whatever the age of the church, however old you go and you grow, you know, you are still young. And the day you meet Jesus and die, you know, die and meet Jesus, you will die young. Can somebody say amen? Even when you're 80 years old, age is only a number. And I want you to live with the same fervency that you have for the Lord uh, when you are 60, 70, 80 years old. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm going to live with that same passion. And that's why I hang around a lot of young people it's because I, I draw passion from you guys, man, because I can just feel passion pulsating in your hearts. You know, that's incredible. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about me for sure. Hallelujah. Okay, wow. Let me just put something on the screen. And uh, well, let me just tell you a story of, guy, uh, of a guy. I don't know if this light should go off. And Can you see that clearly? It's not very clear, right? Can, can the light here go off or something like that? We can just try to see a little bit more clearly. Um, does that work? It, it's okay because I can't switch off these lights. Otherwise, you all will fall asleep. Okay, so let's, if that's okay. Oh, that's, that's that you can't see me. So... <laughs> So Sean, I like to connect with people as I talk, so, so uh, good. Don't worry about that. It's not vital. You just listen to me. Uh, let me tell you about a guy called Danny Cahill. This guy was in his uh, early 40s, and he got into trouble because he was a compulsive smoker and a gambler. He was smoking about three or four packs of cigarettes a day, and he was gambling, losing a lot of money. And uh, he, get, he got into debt, about 45,000 US dollars. He got into debt. And he was shunning himself away, getting angry with his family, and just uh, basically getting aggressive and violent towards his family. His wife 
didn't know what to do with her. His wife Susan didn't know what to do, but she was a believer. And she said, God, could you throw me a bone here? Tell me what I can do with Danny. I just don't know what to do. Am I a wit's end? And uh, the Lord said to her, you know, let me deal with Danny. Just leave Danny in my hands. And then one day out of nowhere, she decided just to chance her luck. And she said, you know, Dan, would you come to church with me? Now, Dan has never been to church before. And she was the one who went to church from time to time when she could. And so Dan, out of, out of the blue, just said, yeah, why not? So he went to church with her for the first time. And that evening, Joyce Meyer was preaching. How many of you have heard of Joyce Meyer? Okay, Joyce Meyer was preaching and Joyce Meyer said these words. She said, every time you're running away from a problem that you ought to be confronting, every time you run away from a problem, and this may be for some of you, every time you run away from a problem when you ought to be confronting, that problem has authority and control over you. And that was like a light switch just went on, you know, just came on in Danny Cahill's mind. Somehow God just grabbed him by the scruff of his psychology and just shook him. And a light switch came on. And by the time they went back home that evening, Danny decided that he was going to do something about this mountain of debt, about this smoking, about this gambling, and about his huge weight. He, he weighed something like 440 pounds, something like almost 220 kilos. That's how much he weighed. He was grossly, grossly overweight. And from that moment, that evening, he decided to take a second job. Uh, and he began a second, look for a second job and began a second job. And bit by bit, week by week, month by month, he be rescheduled his debt and began to pay off his huge mountain of debt. And after two years, he paid off his debt, huge debt of 45,000 US dollars. He had by then stopped smoking. But Danny Kale is not known just for that because a lot of people overcome obstacles like that. He was still weighed 230 kilos, an enormous amount. And he decided to have his chance to try to see if he can shed all that weight. He entered for NBC's eighth season of The Biggest Loser. How many of you have seen that before? The Biggest Loser. And you may remember Danny Cahill's name because he entered for The Biggest Loser, was accepted on the competition, and this TV reality show took him for one year to follow his weight loss process and eventually he lost an incredible 120 kilos 120 kilos until he weighed you know just over just about just under 100 kilos and this is Danny Kale and not only did he enter the competition he won the competition in that season and his name became famous and as a result of that people you know started flocking to him again and hear him and his wife who now travel, both of them now travel the world telling people what Jesus can do for their lives. How they can win over all the obstacles, obsessions, addictions that shackle their lives. How God enables you to have a great breakthrough. They speak to multinational companies, they speak to churches and conferences, tell, telling people about the wonder of Jesus and what God can do in your life. Now, all these figures are very impressive. 45,000 US dollars, 239 pounds, over 120 plus kilos. That's incredible. Those are numbers that draw our attention first. But I will tell you, those are not the most important numbers. These are attention grabbing numbers, but they are not the most important numbers. You know what the most important numbers are? These are the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know why? Because before you can get to 45,000, you need to get through numbers one, two, three, four. Before you can eliminate 239 pounds, you have to get towards eliminating one pound, two pounds, three pounds. These are the magic big figures that every, get just everybody's attention. But the magic numbers, the truly magic numbers, are making one payment after another to cover your mountain of debt. It is losing one pound after another pound after another pound unseen before you can reach 239 pounds. Can somebody say amen to that? Okay, those are the most important numbers. And today, I want to talk about small numbers because small numbers, you know, make up the big numbers. Everybody say after me, small numbers make the big numbers. It's small numbers that make the big numbers. And you are starting a heartbeat in this, in this vicinity here. You're going to start small. Nobody starts big. 
But I will tell you the secret of actually growing, doing, doing, doing well is this. Everybody say after me, think big. Yeah. Say it loud. Think big. Yeah. But start small. And build deep. Okay. Always, whatever you do in life, have this vision. Great vision. Think big. But always start small and build deep. If you start small and you build deep and you build well, bigness will look after itself. Can somebody say amen? If you think big about losing 239 pounds or covering a debt of 45,000, if you say, I want to start big, you will never succeed. But if you say, I start small, I will build deep. I will build a process in my life whereby day after day, I lose half a pound, quarter of a pound. You know, after one week, uh, one pound. And month after month, I make one payment for my, uh, to cover my debt against another. One more payment, one more payment. And then the big will take place. It will look after itself, provided you are prepared to start small and build deep. Can somebody say amen? And the Bible tells us this, so I want you to read. Can you see those words up there? I want you to read it aloud, read it with me, go. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Turn to your neighbor and say, do not despise small beginnings. Because why? The Lord rejoices to see this work begin. Somebody say amen. amen. He rejoices. He rejoices. There's a celebration in heaven. They're waiting just with the same anticipation for what's going to happen here next week. Can you imagine that? When you come in here next week to worship, don't, don't think you're worshiping with each other, you know, and join together. There are unseen heavenly hosts here joining with you in a celebration because the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Can somebody say amen to that? And the Bible tells us the same thing here. And though your beginning is small, yet your latter end would greatly increase. Though your beginning is small, yet your latter end would greatly increase. Say it aloud with me. Let's read it together. Go. And though your beginning is small, yet your latter end would greatly increase. Turn to your neighbor, give them a high five and say, would greatly increase. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> greatly increase. And let's read the last bit together because it's again from the scriptures. This is Jesus telling us the truth. Let's read it together. Go. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Somebody said nothing would be impossible. Nothing would be impossible. Turn to your neighbor, give him a smile and say nothing is impossible. There you are. These are God's words for you. These are God's words for you. He rejoiced to see the work begin. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. You know, you will have one day not enough room. You have to move to bigger premises, more and more meetings and more and more satellites. And though you begin, your beginning is small, yet your latter end would greatly increase for nothing would be impossible. What's the secret of this? It is believing God that God can do great and mighty works. Amen? But for us, it is not those big things. If you want to think big, it's great. But we, we don't reach big things just overnight. It starts with the small things, one at a time. You doing your bit one at a time. And today I want to share, share with you something very, very simple. I thought about what I really wanted to share with you. And I thought, you know, I, I just sense God wants to share this with me, to share this with you. I thought, what to share with you? That starts from a small beginning. And the Lord said, tell my people, sow the gospel. Sow the gospel. So I'm going back to basics, you see. I'm going to preach something about great things, about great, you know, churches, how you build great, you know, congregations. But I'll go back to the principle of think big, but start small and build deep. And sowing the gospel is basically that. I want to talk about sowing the gospel, you know, one person at a time. Bringing one person to the Lord at a time. How many of you would like to bring one person to Jesus this year? Can I see your hands? Wave it in the air. Wave it in the air. If you do that and you disciple that person, there's nothing God cannot do with this church. It will truly, truly multiply. And I will tell you where most people are going to be one to the Lord. Most people are going to be one for the Lord. You know, as far as the scriptures are concerned, not within the confines of the four walls of a church. It's not going to happen. You will have people coming to know the Lord here and receive Jesus. But the greatest number of people who are going to be one for the Lord and brought into this church will be from outside. Will be from outside the four walls of the church. 
the overwhelming bulk of people. Okay, let me just show this to you. The overwhelming bulk of evangelism in the New Testament is not done, was not done, you know, was done actually outside the temple. It was not done within the temple or the synagogue. It was done outside the synagogue or the temple or the church. Okay, here are the people who were one to the Lord outside the church. You just look at them. The disciples, the lepers, the immoral woman, the woman with the issue of blood, the nobleman, Jairus' family, Simon, uh, Peter's mom-in-law, the paralytic let down from the roof, the widow of Nain, the blind man at Beth uh, Bethesda and at Siloam, the blind Bartimaeus, Zacchaeus, the lame man, Sergius Paulus, Lydia, the fortune telling the Philippian jailer, etc., etc., etc. Nearly everyone that you read in the New Testament, the majority of them were one to Christ outside the church. Think about this. And that's why I'm so blessed. And my pastor was sharing, sharing with me that you guys had gone out in this area and doing tracting and, and just sharing the gospel just like that. Isn't it incredible? I'm blessed to see that you're not confined within the walls of a church. Every time the church looks out, good things will happen. Every time the church looks out, you will find the power of God because the gospel is not meant to be shackled within the walls of a church. It's meant to be taken out there. Can somebody say an amen? And when you realize that, you will find that when you walk on the streets, you're waiting for your bus or when you go to your office and you're sitting in a restaurant and you're on a plane next to somebody or something like that, you're always looking for the opportunity, the deposit. You're looking always for the divine appointment. And God provides those divine appointments when you are ready. When you are ready, the divine appointments will appear. When you're never ready, you don't seem to have divine appointments. Do you realize that? But when you're ready, the divine appointments will appear at work, on the bus, in the tram. And you know, when you, at, when you are wait, waiting for, for somebody to turn up at a restaurant, it just happens any and every time. So let us read the scriptures together. Where I want to share with you from the parable of the sower and the seed, where Jesus talks about how we sow. And I would establish four principles by which you sow the gospel. Very simple and yet very effective. Something which I have tried to live for a great deal of my life in sharing the gospel. So I'm going to take you back to the parable of the sower and the seed. And a parable you all know very well. So let's read it aloud together in Mark chapter 4 verses 2 to 20. Read it really loud. Read it so strong that the whole of the suburb can hear it. Okay, so that they will hear it. Can somebody say amen? amen. Turn to your neighbor, turn to your, give him a smile and say, read strong. Okay, are you ready now? Ready, go. He taught them many things by parables and said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. But when the sun came up, they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell amongst thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. Then Jesus said to them, The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, when trouble or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Amen. Can somebody say amen? amen. The word of God will not return to him void. Amen. amen. It will bring much fruitfulness and accomplish that for which he purposed it. Amen. Amen. And this is a parable of the sower and the seed, which you all know very well. But I want to draw four principles out here about how we sow the seed and how the gospel is sown. Now, Jesus was a master storyteller. How many of you like stories during sermons? You know, people who tell stories with sermons. You, you, you like that? You know, most Asians love stories. 
There are lots and lots of stories. Rather than just abstract concepts, you know, after abstract con doctrinal truth after doctrinal truth after doctrinal truth after you just get a little bit, you know, tired. But when the stories come in, everybody perks up. And Jesus taught in the Eastern way. Do you know that? <laughs> Jesus didn't teach. Did, 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 did you read? Jesus didn't go abstract concept after abstract concept after abstract concept. Theology, he told a lot of stories. And he used it from common everyday life. It was an agricultural society. So he used parallels from agricultural society. That's why he used the parable of the sow and the seed. And that's why the common people, because and it was so easy for people to understand. That's why the common people loved him. The fishermen, the, the, you know, the lepers, the people who had no education. They understood him perfectly. And that's why for the same reason, the Pharisees hated him. Because they understood what he was saying about them. And everybody understood what he was saying about them. But Jesus was a master, master storyteller. In the Bible, we find him again and again and again using examples from agrarian life to tell great truths. Parable of the vineyard, the parable of the field that had the great treasure, you know, the parable of the fish, you know, being hauled in. All these were from common countryside pictures. And it is from nature that some of us get some of our greatest insights. Mm. Do you know that one day there was a man walking, uh, taking his dog out for a walk in Switzerland on the, on the mountains. And then he stopped because there was so much of grass seeds stuck to his trousers and to the fur of the dog. And he was pulling out these grass seeds from his trousers and from the fur of the dog. It just was so hard to pull out. And he realized, what made this grass seed so hard to pull out? He, brought, he was an engineer, so he brought it back and looked at these seeds under the microscope. And he found that the reason why these seeds were so effective in sticking onto trousers, cloth, and dog fur was because it had hundreds of little spicules that were hooked. And he thought, that's incredible. So from there came an idea. If he made two pieces of cloth, one with a lots and lots, thousands of little hooks, and another with thousands of little loops for the hooks to hook into, then it should hold quite tightly. And he did. He made two pieces of vel velvet cloth, put them together, one with lots of hooks, one with lots of loops, and they're held together very fast. You can pull them apart. But when you slide at them, they came apart very quickly. And thus was born the idea of Velcro. So Velcro came from grass seeds. Isn't it amazing? Now some of you are well, everyone's wearing Velcro these days. You got Velcro these days. See, inspiration gives us inventions. I mean, the, the thorns of the Osage oranges, it's got a three-pronged, prong, uh, uh, all in facing various directions. From there came the concept of the barbed wire fence. You know, and from the, from the teeth of the beetle grub, yes, if you see these little tiny beetle grubs, you know, you just put a piece of leaf there, within minutes, it's all true through. And people look at it and say, how can this tiny little grub chew through a whole leaf within a minute or two? And then they examined the teeth structure of the beetle grub. And they found that the, the teeth of the beetle grub were actually lined in a continuous way, circular way, endless. They were just cutting through the leaves like that. And that was born the idea of the chainsaw. Okay. There were interesting things that came from nature. And Jesus was a master storyteller. He took examples from nature. And when he tells you a story, you never forget it. You'll never forget it. And then he used a parable of the sower and the seed to tell you four principles by which we are to sow the gospel. I want you to understand this as not something external to you. I want you to understand and receive this as something internal to you. So that when you take the principle I'm sharing with you tonight, you will take with them, you know, as a spirit, take that impartation, that spirit of impartation of the gospel into your heart so that it begins to flow out of you. And you will do these things, not because you are forced to, you're obliged to, because Jesus is looking down from heaven with a whip and whipping you to do it. No, because you have been saved by grace. Somebody prayed you into the kingdom of God. Somebody shared the gospel with you. And out of gratitude to God, who has showered you with his grace and love, you share the gospel out of gratitude and thankfulness. There are four principles by which we share the gospel. The first is this, so simply. Okay, how do we sow the gospel? Firstly, so simply. Everybody say, so simply. So simply. How do we begin? We sow simply. Now, it says here, the, 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 the sower went out to sow. Okay, 
How many of you seen farmers sowing seeds before? Maybe you live in Sydney and brought them to Sydney. You probably don't see what it's like on a farm. How many of you seen farmers sow seed before? You haven't. It's good sometimes to go back into the countryside and see how farmers do it. Of course, these days, everything is mechanized because it's tractor. But you come to my part of the world, in lots of Asia, most parts of Asia, people are still using traditional way of sowing, just like in Jesus' days. When you say sow the seed, you sow it very simply, right? How, how many ways are they sowing the seed? There are only one or two ways. There are only a few ways. You sow the seed like that. You put the seed in a pouch. You take them out and you sow them on the ground. That's very simple. I mean, sometimes you dig a hole and you put the seeds in and you plant them. Okay? Sometimes once in a while you scatter the seeds. All right. That's about it. Sowing the seed is the only simple ways of sowing the seed. You never complicate the way you sow the seed. Can somebody say amen? I mean, you don't see a farmer going like this and like this, you know, and like this and doing the wrap as he sows seeds. No farmer does that. No farmer complicates the sowing of the seed. And yet, when we come to share the gospel, we sometimes complicate it. Do you know what I mean? Instead of sharing something simple, you say, are you, are you saved and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Are you justified and glorified in Jesus' name? Hallelujah. Excuse me, why do you have to make it so complicated? The farmer sows the seed. And the seed itself is a very simple thing. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, you know, the seed is the word. Everybody said the seed is the word. The word, the word, the seed is the word. And the seeds and words are very simple things, right? What are words meant for? What are words meant for? Bad breath. No, words are, words are for communication. That's true. And the gospel is the simplest word you can show. You can show. Okay, the gospel. The gospel in itself is very simple. It's very simple. True? How many of you agree with me? The gospel is very simple. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine so that you might be born again and, and, and be with God forever. Can I can see your hands? It's simple, yes? Amen? Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's very simple. Very simple. Okay. And the gospel is very simple. Okay? Because it's like the seed. Well, how, how complicated is a seed? I mean, a seed, have you seen seeds before? You have, right? A seed is a seed, is a seed. It's a simple, I mean, it just looks like a, a seed. There's nothing else. But once, but if, when, but there's life in the seed, just like there's life in the gospel. When the seed touches the ground and the conditions are right, suddenly something complex begins to happen. It's very complicated now, but when you sow it, it's very simple. Because the seed has life. The gospel has life. To in a complex way to transform your life. But when you sow it, just keep it simple. It hits the ground. And then a small root begins to come out of that, that seed. And then the root goes downwards. And then suddenly a small shoot starts shooting up. It sprouts. There are some leaves. And it grows bigger and taller. Some branches. More leaves. And then eventually flowers, and eventually fruits, and it grows big. It becomes like a giant oak tree that gives shelter to the birds and to people, and it's a huge tree. Where did it come from? Just a seed. It's very simple. And that is the power of the gospel. It's something very simple, but it can multiply. And somebody said this you can count the number of seeds in one apple, but you cannot count the number of apples in one seed. The truth? And that's the power of the gospel. So when you share the gospel, keep it simple. Turn to your neighbor and say, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yeah, turn to your neighbor one more time and say, for goodness sake, keep it simple. <laughs> and he's talking about you. He's talking about you. Keep it simple, man. Keep it simple, man. So my, so the, you know, the principle of sharing the gospel, keep it simple, is the principle of kiss. Kiss. Kiss means keep it simple. No, saints. Keep it simple, saints. Okay. <laughs> Keep it simple, saints. Okay? It's the kiss principle. When you share the gospel, keep it simple, saints. Okay? Keep it simple. So every, lift up your hands. It's the kiss principle. And make a twinkle, twinkle little star with your fingers. Now put it to your lips and blow a kiss at me. Go. Mm. Thank you. Everybody say kiss. Okay, blow one more kiss and sh I'd say kiss. Ready? Blow a kiss at me and go kiss. Kiss. Thank you. I receive that in Jesus' name. Thank you for your love and affection. In the name of Jesus. Take it, lift up your hand one more time. Okay, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Put it to your lips now and turn to somebody randomly around you and go, mm, kiss, okay. <laughs> That's the kiss principle. 
That's how you share the gospel. Amen. The kiss principle. Keep it simple, saints. Because words are meant to be for communication. I mean, how, why do you want words to be complicated? To complicate. The seed is where the, the gospel has life. So just keep it simple. You know, the great theologian Karl Barth, the great theologian of the last century, was lecturing in Princeton University to a group of divinity students. And during Q&A time, one of the divinity students put up his hand and said, Professor Barth, the great theologian Professor Barth, what is the greatest thought that has ever crossed your incredibly, you know, intelligent and sophisticated mind in theology? What's, what's the greatest thought? And Barth was stunned by this question for a while. And he said, the greatest thought that's ever crossed my mind is, is simply this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Isn't that incredible? Because words are meant to communicate. I don't know about you, but when I, I grew up, uh, there was a group called the Bee Gees. How many of you heard of this group? Can I see your hands? What, you're only, you're under, most of you are under 20, you've heard of the Bee Gees? You already heard of the Bee Gees. By the way, if you don't know who the Bee Gees are, ask Pastor Joshua, he knows about who the Bee Gees are, okay? The Bee Gees once wrote a song called Words. Have you ever heard that song? Some of the older ones would know. And, and, it, and it, you know, it, it's, it's a very famous song. I, I grew up, you know, humming and singing words. And there was a, a bit of a, there was this, this words, this is lyrics. It goes, it's only words and words are all I have to take your heart away. <laughs> so it's only words and words are all I have to take your heart away. And the word, the, Jesus says, the seed is the word. Yes or no? Now, there are people who say to me, actually, I don't need to share the gospel. I just need to live the gospel. And you know, if my living is, is a demonstration of the gospel, I hate to disagree with you, but you are wrong. <laughs> Everywhere you go in the New Testament, they share the gospel. They open their mouth. Yes, you have to live your life. If you live your life in the office, you have to be consistent with what you say. But sooner or later, when the rubber hits the road, you still have to open your mouth. Because the gospel itself is called the kerygma in, in, the, old, in the New Testament. In the Greek, it's called kerygma. Everybody say kerygma. K-E-R-Y-G-M-A. Kerygma means proclamation. You have to use words. You have to open your mouth and say it. Don't, it, it's a cop-out if you say, well, I, I work in the office just by my example, my kindness to people. I, you know, people will come to know Jesus. I will tell you that may be, I happened once in a long, long time in a blue moon. Once in infancy, it may happen, but it will rarely happen. I will tell you, you can live the life of a saint in the city of Sydney. You, you don't expect people, if you say, oh, I've lived 20 years as a saint, you know, in Sydney, I, I treat everybody so well. I will tell you the number of people who come and bow down before you and say, I see your life. It is so incredible. You know, tell me what's the secret of your life. That would be very rare. <laughs> is that true? Until you open your mouth. Why do you live a good life? Why do you live an exemplary life? Why do you have integrity and honesty? Why are you kind? Why are you helpful? What for in your office in the city? What for what reason? To give you a leverage to open your mouth to share the gospel. That's what you're living for. So when you have lived that life, it gives you the leverage. Then open your mouth and share the gospel. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say amen? So this is what we can learn. Uh, how, how, you know, people say, Pastor, I, I actually don't know how to open a conversation about the gospel. Sooner or later, you've got to open your mouth and open a conversation. Turn to your neighbor and say, open your mouth. Okay, don't open your mouth just to eat, open your mouth just to talk, open your mouth to share the gospel. How do we open a conversation? Let me give you the, let me give the stages in which you open your mouth. This is the Ethiopian you know, who, who had the gospel shared to him by Philip, the evangelist. And this is what Philip did, okay? God asked him to go and meet the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And we, we are told that he went. And this is what happened. There are three stages to opening a conversation in the gospel. Let's read it together. Go. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, so Philip opened his mouth and told him the good news about Jesus. See, you want to open a conversation about the gospel, you must do three things. You must firstly go near. 
You must go there. Secondly, you must overtake. And thirdly, you must open your mouth. What does go near mean? What does go near mean? Go near, overtake, and open your mouth. What does go near mean? Go near means just go all near and open a conversation. Hi, how are you? Yeah, how are you doing today? If you know somebody, it's hi, how are you doing today? How's the weekend? And how, uh, how's your mom doing? And, uh, you know, how's your dog? Was your dog, you know, been up to trouble again, you know, over the weekend? Just open a conversation. Basically, say, somebody say, go near. Somebody say, go near. Okay. Uh, you know, hi, how are you doing? You know, um, you know, uh, I'm... Uh, if you if if you meet a stranger for the first time, hi, how are you doing? You know, I'm uh, I'm I'm a lecturer in this college. You know, yeah, yeah, I work in this bank. You know, and uh, I I live around this area. Oh yeah, yeah. How are you doing? My name is uh, Kim, and I live around this area. And uh, you doing okay? I just open a conversation. Now most people most people don't open a conversation. I'm going to tell you this. Philip the evangelist opened a conversation. How by going near? The first thing you must do is you must go near. Now, don't go near any and everybody on the street or any and everybody. Look for God's divine appointment for you. And you just go near. You're waiting at a bus stop. Hi, how are you doing? Good day today. Gorgeous weather in Sydney this last few days, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, well, it's really nice. You know, it's, it's one of the best weather we've had. By the way, my, I'm Philip and uh, I live around this area. Oh, mm, then you, they, they may or may not want to share their name. Nice to know that. And they may want to share, oh, I'm, I'm Jane. I, I live around this area too. Yeah, you know, um, it's a good area, good suburb, isn't it? Yeah, my, my kids love the suburb. You know, they go to play school down the road, let's say. And they say, whoa, you got me. How many kids do you have? You've gone near. Do you understand that? You've gone near. But you can't keep going near all the time. You just like conversation after conversation and then you never get down. You, it's like you're circling, but you never land. Do you know what I mean? Eventually you become like a dog chasing its own tail all the time, do you know? So you must, because Philip, very shortly after going near, he overtook. He overtook. After going near, you, over, you overtake. You see, so this is what he did. When you overtake, what do you mean by overtake? You overtake by steering a conversation towards the gospel. That's how you overtake. Okay, this is something you must learn to do. Ah, it's good, yeah. Well, my kids go to, you know, to the play school down there and they enjoy it very much too. By the way, now you steer the conversation. You only one bite of the apple, just in a conversation. Has anyone told you that God loves you? Oh. Has anyone shared with you about God's love for you? Okay. You have overtaken. Overtaking means you steer the conversation towards the gospel. You have only one bite of the cherry. But if you're working with your colleagues in the office, you may have several bites of the cherry. That's okay. You can take your time with that. But sometimes with a stranger, only one bite. So you steer the conversation. You've gone near. Start a conversation. Then in a short while, within a few sentences, one or two minutes later, you steered it. You've overtaken. Has anyone told you that God loves you? Has anyone shared with you about God's love for you? You know, don't ask words like, are you a Christian? Because <laughs> they have their own definitions of Christianity. No, I, I'm not a Christian because I, you know, I don't believe, I believe everybody. You see, immediately all the defenses come out. Don't open with, are you a Christian? Don't open this. Anyway, the word Christianity doesn't have such a good connotation in the Western world today, true? They've got so many hang-ups. The moment you say, are you a Christian? They've got hang-ups already. All the guilt start flaring. Do you know? So, by the way, has anyone told you that God loves you? Has anyone shared the gospel of, of God's love with you? They can only answer yes or no, right? Right? They get, the answer can only be yes or no. If the answer is yes, no, if the answer is no, nobody's shared this with me, then you say, do you mind if I take a minute to share this with you, just one minute. Do you mind if I just take one minute? It's hard for somebody to say, to turn you down. Just one minute. Do you mind if I take one minute? If the reply is, yes, I've heard it before. Yes, I've heard it before. Can you then say to them, do you mind if I take one minute to tell you a bit more? So whether they say yes or no, you're going to share it anyway. <laughs> you got it? You got it? So have I opened, see, I've told you now, this is the principle of opening the gospel. Everybody say, go near. Yeah. Everybody say, overtake. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor, uh, say to them, go near and overtake. Yeah. Okay, so now, see, and I would tell you 70% of people will say, yeah, okay, what's one minute? Yeah, go ahead. There's about 20% of people saying, nah, I don't want that stuff. That's fine. But 70%, but think, if you didn't open your mouth, 
70% of the people you met would not have a chance to hear the gospel. True. But you open your mouth, you see. And therefore, you go near and you overtake with this, with this. And as you overtake, then this is what you do. How do you share the gospel in one minute? How many of you like to learn to share the gospel in one minute? Wave, wave your hand at me. Now, I want you to, at the, at the end of this, you take the photograph, okay, with your mobile phones, because this four step will take less than one minute. Okay, the four step, corner. they said, okay, you got one minute. Okay, this is how you share it. This is how you begin. God, you see, number one, God showed his love for you when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. Do you know God showed his love for you when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine? Now, most people will hear, know a little bit about Jesus already. They may not know a lot, but 80% of the people will know who Jesus is, even if they use him as a swear word. Okay? They, they, would, they would know who, who Jesus is. Do you know? Okay, God showed his love for you and me, for you and me, not just for you, but for you and me, when he's died on the cross for your sins and mine. Just go straight to the gospel. For your sins and mine means it's not, in, it's not offensive. For your sins and mine. God showed his love for us when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. Point number one. Point number two. Today, he stands at the door of your heart and is knocking. That's a great picture. Today, he stands at the door of your heart. He's knocking. Great picture. Immediately, they, they, they have this association. The third thing you say is, if you will open the door of your heart to him today, he will come in. He will come into your heart, fill you with his love and give you a new life. Yeah. Fill you with his love, forgive your sins and give you a new life. Okay, that's the third thing you say. And here's the fourth thing. Would you like to receive Jesus in your heart today? See? Less than one minute. Take pictures, please, everybody. Not of me. Up there. Okay, up there. Okay. Would you like to receive Jesus into your heart? And I will tell you this, I will tell you this, okay? 50% of the people you share with will say, no, 35% of the people, one third, 33% of the people you share with will say yes. They will say yes. 33% of the people will say, thank you very much, but I'm not sure. No, no, give me some time. I'm not sure about this. And 33% of the people will reject you outright. But here's the point. If you never open the gospel, your mouth, those 33% would never have received the Lord. Think about it when God gives you divine opportunities. Okay? But very few people would swear at you. Okay? If they do swear that last 10% of people, you know, they swear you, you know, get off my back, you blankety blank, religious bigot and free. Very few people would do that. I would tell you. But even if they did, even if they did and you feel a bit hurt and you feel a bit ashamed, listen to me. Has Jesus taken away your shame? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? Has Jesus taken away your pain? Yes or no? Has Jesus taken away your suffering? Yes or no? So what's that for Jesus? To step out the extra foot. He has taken it off for you. So if you get a pain and you get a hurt and you get a bit of shame, it's fine. One third of the people will do that for you. But sometimes when you start sharing, all that one third of the people, the bad guys you're going to meet, you happen to see them in the first four or five times you share. So don't get discouraged, okay? It evens out. The odds all even out. You know, everything evens out. You know, after that, everybody you share with will come to know Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Oh, don't say, oh, the first three times you shared, I got massacred. I'm not going to do it again. There's a bloodbath. Don't ever do that. It's the devil's way of trying to discourage you. Okay, you just keep going. The third, the fourth person still reject you. And the sixth person swears at you, nearly hits you. The seventh person received Jesus. The eighth, the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh. Just keep on doing it. It evens out one third, one third, one third. So, okay. Everybody say after me these four points, okay? And, sh and read it aloud, go. God showed his love for you when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. Number two, today he stands at the door of your heart and knocks. Number three, if you will open your heart to him, he will come in and fill you with his love and a new life. Number four, would you like to receive Jesus into your heart today? Turn to your neighbor, give him a smile and say, would you like to receive Jesus into your heart today? All this in one minute. One minute. Do I use it? Oh, I use it all the time when I just sense Holy Spirit prompting me. Give an example. You know, um, last year, I was uh, invited to speak in Kuala Lumpur. You know, I had to fly into KL and there at KLIA, KL International Airport, uh, somebody met me and uh, the pastor wasn't there, but he sent a limousine to meet me. 
And there were two guys, was with two Indian guys waiting there with my, my name, Reverend Dr. Philip Lin, you know? And I said, oh, wow, I'm, I'm the guy. I, I'm him. Oh, sir, thank you. Uh, you are Dr. Philip Lin. Uh, I was there with Nancy, my wife. And, she, and one of them said, sir, I'll go and get the limousine for you. Please wait. And the other one said, sir, you just wait here with me and he will come. So while he was, while he was waiting, we were waiting for the limousine to come. I began to talk to the guy who was waiting with us. His name was Murugan. He was an Indian guy. Murugan was his name. So as I was waiting for the limo, I said, by the way, Murugan, you know, uh, you know, are you married? I'm going near. No, he says, no, sir, I'm not married. I'm not married. Oh, I said, do you have a girlfriend? Yes, I've got a girlfriend. How long have you been going out? Two years. Oh, two years. That's wonderful. You must, you must love her very much. Yes, I love her. But when are you going to get married? I have no money to get married, sir. You know, would you like me to pray that you will have money one day and so that you can marry your, your, your girlfriend so that God will bless you? He said, yeah, I would love that. By the way, I've gone near. Okay. I overtake now. By the way, have you ever heard that? Has anyone ever told you that God loves you? No. Oh, by the way, Murugan, would you mind if I take just one minute to tell you about God's love for you? Sure. Murugan, I want to tell you this. You know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. You know, he loved you. God loves you so much that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. And do you know that today he stands at the door of your heart and he's knocking. And Murugan, if you open the door of your heart, he will come into your life and give you a new life and fill you with his love. And Murugan, would you, would you like to receive Jesus in your heart today? Yeah? He says, yes. So, so Murugan, can I pray for you to receive Jesus? Can you pray with me? He said, yeah, okay. So I prayed. He said, the sinner's prayer with me. And he received Jesus into his heart. Just as I was finishing the prayer with him, he said, in Jesus' name, amen, his colleague came back. His colleague's name is Raghu. Raghu came back and stood there. He suddenly saw that we were eyes closed and we were praying together. And he just waited until our eyes opened. And I said, hi, Raghu, welcome back. He says, yeah, yeah, your car is ready. Your car is ready. I said, Raghu, do you know, um, has anyone told you <laughs> that God loves you and Jesus died across your sin? No, no, no. You know, then I go into all four things. And would you like to pray to receive Jesus into your heart today? When I asked the fourth question, he didn't know what to do. He looked at his friend Murugan, who had just prayed to receive Jesus. And Murugan said, yeah, yeah, receive. <laughs> So he opened his heart to receive Jesus. So two persons received Jesus into their lives. And guess what? I take, I take their phone number. Why is that? Because I want to encourage them to visit a particular church near where they are. And secondly, I keep in touch with them just to encourage them. I send them verses just to encourage them. I'm doing long, long, long distance follow-up. It's not very effective, but better than no follow-up. I just take that number and I give them my number. Okay? Then I go to the taxi and the limo. And in this limo, it's a guy, this guy, who's driving the limo. And he, he, he speaks, he doesn't speak English, he speaks Mandarin. Now my Mandarin is horrid, but I, I, I learned to speak Mandarin with him the best way I can. Why not sacrifice for Jesus? Even though, you know, you can't, and uh, you, you can't speak the language, or just, just sacrifice. So he was speaking, he was driving, and then I said the same thing to him. You know, I was talking to him about his family, go near. Oh, what a family. He has challenges because he says he doesn't believe in God, but he has uh, two, one, a son and a daughter. They go to church. He allows them to go to church. They can do whatever they like, but don't disturb his God. As far as he, he's, he, he's, he's a Buddhist pagan. He doesn't believe in all these things, but uh, they, that, his children can do whatever they like. He's telling me about life as a taxi driver. And then I overtake. By the way, has anybody ever told you that God loves you? Has anybody told you about this gospel story, Jesus loves you? He said, no, I hear about Jesus, but, uh, you know, I don't know. My, my son and daughter, they, they go to church. I said, no, it's about God's love. Has anybody told you? He said, none. I said, would you mind if I take a minute to tell you uh, about God's love for you? He said, yeah, sure, fine. I'm already in a taxi. You're here. So, you know, what's, what's one minute? So I told him the four things. And at the end of the four things, I said to him, would you like to open your heart to receive Jesus today? He said, how to open my heart? I said, you pray this prayer with me to invite Jesus in. He said, how to pray? I'm driving a taxi. I can't shut my eyes. I said, you can pray with your eyes open, okay? He said, really? I said, yeah. Would you like to receive Jesus? Yeah, okay. If I can pray with my eyes open, I will receive Jesus. So I prayed for him, with him. And he followed me in the prayer. But I kept my eyes open just to make sure he kept his eyes open when he was, pray <laughs> when he was praying, okay? And he received Jesus. And his name is Hugh Min. When he arrived at the, at the, uh, at the uh, hotel, 
He came up of a taxi, greeted me, gave me a hug. Okay, his name is Human. He came to know Jesus. I got his phone number. I, I, I tell him which church to go to in KL. Or I put somebody in touch with him. You see, it, it's simple like this. But somebody needs to open your mouth. And the, the, when you open your mouth, sometimes in the office, for example, you continue to gossip. Okay, how many of you are good at gossiping? Can I see your hands? I want you to gossip the gospel. Okay, the Bible wants you to gossip the gospel. And that's how you share your, your words with the gospel. You see, if you're in somebody, you're, you're working for somebody in the office, they're not going to be a one-off meeting. So you don't have to use the four, four ways immediately. You've got to have lots of other opportunities. So what you do is you gossip the gospel. So what do you do over the weekend when you ask them? Yeah, well, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I, my boyfriend and I, I had a great time. We went up to the Gold Coast and spent the weekend together. We had fun. So what did you do over the weekend? They'll ask you. And you say, well, I went to listen to this funny Malaysian guy, you know, in my church. And, uh, and you know, I was so blessed. And after that, I went to pray for my, my aunt in hospital. And my aunt had a bad, you know, foot and a gout. And after that, you know, she, she got better. She got better. The following day, she got better. Now, when they ask you and you start going down this church line, yeah, they really regret they're asking you what you did over the weekend, okay? But they can't stop you because they asked you. It'd be too rude to interrupt. Do you understand what I mean? So they will patronize you. Oh, okay, I'm glad. I'm glad. Like at the back of their mind, they say, oh my goodness, when is it going to stop? But they ask you and you're the friends, so they can't stop you. So you just tell them about this. What you're doing, you're just depositing the gospel in. You're gossiping the gospel. You're depositing it. That's how the early days the gospel spread. Because the, the women go to the well and say, have you heard? You know, there's apostles there. You know, that, that, those group of men there. Oh, there's a mighty wind and there was a fire. And, the, and then they preach and 3,000 people got saved. Do you, have you heard of the man? He was at the temple gate, you know, and, and he got up and walked. He'd been name all his life. They were gossiping, gossiping, gossiping at the well. That's how the gospel spread in the early, day, in the early church. And so you just gossip the gospel. And now your friend has formed a mental picture. You are, you're a religious freak, freak. You are a Christian nut, you know. And you pray to God and you believe in miracles, you believe in healing, but because you are friends, you're so kind in every other way, you're normal. And actually you do quite well. You do quite well in your work and you're kind and you're gracious. And, and they'll continue to, you know, to hang around with you. And from time to time, you just saw the fact that you, you know, you've seen miracles happen and you prayed for this. And then one day, you're having lunch with your friend. And, uh, you know, and Jessica, your friend, will sit down and say, hey, Jess, you're a little bit kind of down in the dumps today. Anything wrong? Well, no, no, it's okay. I mean, I, yeah, everybody has problems, you know, but yeah. And then God tells you, it's her mother. Word of knowledge. Is it about your mom? Yeah. How'd you know? Well, don't, don't get weird and say, God told me. No, don't get weird. I, I just sense, <laughs> I just sense, it's your mom. Uh, yeah, it's my mom. She's got cancer, has been to hospital and, you know, the doctors are having to deal with her. It's quite, it's quite advanced, they, they tell us. And we're all shocked by this and, and, uh, Anyway, you know, you, you believe in all this God and all that kind of stuff, you know, you don't mind just, when you go to your church this weekend, just light a candle for my mom. They're talking terms like that, you know, light a candle for my mom, you know, or, you know, say something to your, pray, pray to your old man up there or whatever God. Uh, and you say, sure, Jess, I, in fact, I, can I pray for your mom? Yeah, yeah. Don't forget to pray this weekend. No, Jess, I, can I pray now? <gasps> no. For goodness sake, we're in a restaurant, for goodness sake. I'm not religious, I do not pray. But can I just pray for your mom? I guess so. Do I have to shut my eyes? No, you don't have to shut your eyes. Just, just, I'll just pray, okay? Yeah, uh, make it quick. This is restaurant, you know. Okay, and you pray. Jess, at the Lord, I just pray for Jess's mom, that you, you will touch her and heal her. Bring your love into the family. Draw the family together during this time. Let your blessing and your favor come upon this, this family. Lord, that your love and your peace will fill Jess' mom right now, even in the hospital. Lord, heal her in Jesus' name, I pray. Open your eyes, you look at Jess, she's watering around the eyes. I've seen people like that, they start tearing. God uses the gossip to touch the hearts. And that gives you the right now to open, open the conversation. By the way, Jess, I've known you so long, we've worked in the office for the last two years, but has anybody told you about God's love for you? See, it's supernaturally natural. Naturally supernatural. What you do is natural, but it's supernatural. And as you're led by, led by the Holy Spirit to do something supernatural, it's very natural. It just comes out your mouth. You say it. And that's how we begin to share the gospel. And the gospel shared like that is very powerful. Why? Because Pastor Josh cannot reach the people in your office. You can. True? Pastor Josh cannot, cannot reach members of your family who are, who are, 
who have animosity towards him. But you can. Your extended family, your cousins, your aunts, you can. Pastor George cannot reach all the, the citizens of, of Sydney, but you can. In your area, various areas of work, you can touch them. And that's what God wants you to do because 39 out of the 40 miracles in the Acts of the Apostles, listen to me, 39 out of the 40 miracles recorded for us in the Acts of the Apostles, the early church, were all done outside the church. The salvations are all outside the church. So while you want to bring people in here, there will be salvations. There will be become to the Lord. The bulk of the people who are going to be touched by the Lord are going to be touched by you Monday to Friday. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. And that is how you grow the church. That's a biblical way. Because I will tell you this, whatever it is, okay, just on statistics alone, the world will not come into the church. The church must go into the world. Amen. Can somebody amen? By, by that statistic, let me tell you, supposing this church is 10,000, you go to 10,000, that's a super mega church, man. But compared to the population of Sydney, it's a drop in the bucket in the ocean. It's nothing. You can have 10 churches of 10,000 in the whole of Sydney. It's still nothing. It's the only way for the world to, to be touched, and the only way for Sydney to be touched is the church must go out into the world. It cannot be this way. We want to grow our church, of course, but you know we must share the gospel at our place of work. You gossip. I had a great weekend. Something good happened last week. You know what? I prayed for my aunt, etc. Et you see, that's the first thing. That's a, you know, I've just given some examples how you can sow the word, okay? You sow the word, you know, by, by going near, overtaking, and opening your mouth, okay? And if you're in the office, then by gossiping, okay? How many of you want to be great gossipers for Jesus? Okay, turn to your neighbor and, and give them a high five and say, you're a gossiper, okay? <laughs> Here's the second way. Here's the second way in which you share the gospel, okay? Very quickly now. You sow faithfully. Not only do you sow simply. Everybody says, sow simply. You also sow faithfully. Look, the, 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 the guy went out. He just kept sowing. He didn't say good weather, bad weather. He was just sowing. So we sow faithfully anytime, anytime. All types of ground. The guy sowed in all types of ground, faithfully. You know, sometimes when you sow faithfully, you don't see any results. You waste time, sometimes money, effort. You don't see any results. Just keep sowing faithfully. And some of the faithful ways you must sow, are, are especially with your fam members of your family. You know, I, I sowed, when I came to know the Lord as a teenager, my father, by the way, I'm a third, fourth generation Anglican. That was, that was my background. Anyone like me, Anglicans? Oh man, Church of England. <laughs> Church of England, man. Ooh, yeah, it's okay. But anyway... Uh, at the Church of England. I, I grew up in an Anglican church. And, uh, you know, I, was, I went to the whole lot, the confirmation, the baptism, every, the whole lot. You know, uh, but initially it was just bored me to tears. Yeah, I, I didn't understand half the sermons there, but I'm very grateful later in my life when I went to university, I continued worshiping in an evangelical Anglican church there, believe in Jesus, and I, I grew from there. But in my early days as a kid, I was brought to church by my mom. And then, I, you know, she... But, you know, they were, my family was generational Anglicans. They had no living relationship with Jesus. Just generational Anglicans. When I became a Christian, and I tried to share the gospel with my dad, my dad didn't want to have anything to do with it. He said, I've eaten, I don't know if you heard this statement in, in Korean, but he, I've eaten more salt than you've eaten rice. So don't try to teach me new tricks. Okay, that's what he said to me. My father was a very proud man. And every Sunday, he would just go out game hunting, big game hunting in the jungles, or he would play golf, or he would plant his hog orchids. Three things. We hardly saw him over the weekends. He was always away. We never saw him. And he never went to church. He only went to church once in my lifetime that I can remember. And it was when I was acting at the age of nine in a nativity play, you know, in Christmas. And I was, had a small, very teeny weeny part as the innkeeper. Mary and Joseph comes to the inn and knocks on the door of the inn, okay? And I poke out my head and open the door of the inn. I poke out my head and say, there's no room in the inn. And I slam it shut. <laughs> and they, he came just to watch me in that, in that nativity play, for which I'm always grateful, you know what I mean? But he never ever came to church other than that instance. And he was a very proud man. I used to say, as far as I'm concerned, all religions are the same. And as far as I'm concerned, I've read Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. He did that in high school for a religious knowledge exam. And he passed it with distinction. He says, I know the Bible. 
So you don't have to teach me the Bible. So I prayed for my dad from the day when I, I was born again, you know, in my teenage years, right through for many, 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 20, 25, 30 years. And then one day, my dad came to visit me. He lived in another city in Malaysia, and he came to visit me and with my mom. You know, uh, with my mom, he came to visit me. And then we were going up to a church camp. I said, Dad, come up to the church camp with us. You know, four days away for a retreat. And he said, no, 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 I don't go for all this, any of these things. But eventually, one of my friends persuaded him to come up. And my friend persuaded him to come by saying this, Uncle, this is the way they addressed my dad, you know, Uncle, you don't have to attend any of those sessions when we go up to the church retreat. There's a golf course just nearby. <laughs> we play golf, Uncle. My dad said, every day, every day, you don't have to attend the sessions. Wow. Say that my dad said to me, I'm going, I'm going to your church camp. <laughs> okay. So he packed his golf bags and everything into the car and we went up to that church retreat place. But we arrived at night in the evening because the evening meal, first meeting after dinner for that evening. But my dad wouldn't come for the meetings at all. He didn't want. He was waiting for his golf game to begin at the crack of dawn, six o'clock, tea of time the next morning. So at six o'clock in the morning the next day, he sprang out of bed, drew open the curtains. It was pouring with rain. It was raining cats and dogs. And whole day for golf is ruined. So after breakfast, he went back to his room. He wouldn't come for the meetings. He didn't know what to do. He was just so restless. He was pacing up and down his room like a, a caged tiger. Have you seen tigers in the zoo before? They just go walk up and down and they go up and down. They're really restless. And there was my dad. He was really restless. Eventually, this friend of mine came and knocked on his door and said, Uncle, don't waste your time in there. It's a meeting. Why don't you just go up to the meeting? There's nothing else to do here. The guy said, no, 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 I'm not going. But eventually, he was persuaded and he came up to the meeting. You must understand. I've waited 30 years for my dad to come to a meeting. He would never come to a meeting. I was sitting in the front row. I was not a pastor then. Yeah, he was sitting in the front row. And I was just a, 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 a deacon in the church then. Sitting, and somebody said, your dad's come. My dad. Wow. 30 years. He's finally come to church. Oh God, I said, it's hard, to, it's so hard to get him into church. Let the preacher preach something about God's love, about the return of the prodigal son, about God's love for you. Oh God, just touch his heart. My dad was sitting right at the back, really restless, arms folded. And the preacher went up and he said, today, the subject of my talk is pride. <laughs> There are a lot of proud people here. God hates proud people. You stiff-necked bunch. And then my dad was sitting like that. And I thought, my goodness, I waited 30 years for my dad to come. And what? This guy can't spoil it all. Just pride. My goodness. Ooh, my dad will never come. I ever come to church again. And then he makes an altar call at the end. And now I want all these people. God wants to break your pride. You proud people, come out and repent before Jesus. For altar call. Give your heart to Jesus. I thought, not in a million years. My dad's not going to do that. And, you know, one or two people, a few people, that kind of altar call, you don't get a lot of people. You know, just a few people came up. Ooh, they were crying. You know, they were stiff-necked because they didn't want to receive Jesus. You know, a few of them came up. And my dad was sitting there adamant. She was like, no. And I thought to myself, that's it. It's not going to come out. But somehow, this friend of mine who invited my dad to the golf game, he, he had just had some gumption, Holy Spirit boldness. He just went up to my dad, you know, and he said, uncle, I think the speaker is talking about you. <laughs> and my dad sprang out of his seat, looked at him in the, in the eyes, and I thought my dad was going to punch him one, you know, for impudence. But my dad looked at him and said, I think so too, and he came forward. And that's how my dad received Jesus at the age of 69. He received Jesus at the age of 69. And then, you know, and, 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 and then he became, he started coming to church, eventually. And when the Skyline Church started, he was the oldest member of Skyline Church. Continued to worship uh, in Skyline Church. And he died at the age of 89, 29 years later. And when he died, when he died, the song that we all sang was the song. The song that we sang with tonight, Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He's mighty to save. It was one of the happiest funerals that we ever had. Friends of mine who came to this funeral said, is this a funeral? I said, yeah, it's a funeral. <laughs> and my mom was so full of joy, not that my dad had died, but you know, he's gone to be with the Lord. <laughs> Everybody came and greeted my mom. And my, you know, they were crying and my mom said, don't cry, don't cry. He's in a better place. I hugged them and said, you okay, huh? So next, next, no. <laughs> and it was like, 
And this was my family, so faithfully. So many times over the years, I lay hands on my dad's photograph. I pray for my dad. He just tells me, just get lost, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But at the right time, God sent somebody. I can bring people to know the Lord by hundreds, evangelism and personal, but I couldn't reach my dad. So by God, I had to open. See, somebody, if you are faithful in sowing into the kingdom of God, right? Somebody, God will make sure somebody is faithful in sowing into your family. Even though your family may not listen to you. Can somebody say amen to that? So everybody say, so faithfully. And now so sacrificially. Here's the third one. So sacrificially of your time, your tears, and your toil. Okay. Now listen to me. The, the, the sower, he sowed sacrificially. He looked at his soil, it's rocky. Chances are nothing will get come back. He will not get any, any returns, but he sowed it anyway. He looked at that soil, it was full of weeds and thorns. He sowed it anyway. He looked at that soil, it was just it was rocky. So he put there, the, he sowed there, the birds came and ate it up. I will tell you, he lost 75% of what he sowed. And that may be your experience in sharing the gospel. You may lose, I said two thirds, two thirds of the people will not reach. You may lose 66% of what you sow. Just like the sower lost 75%. But you just need that 25%. That one quarter of seed that thrives and that produce fruits that multiply 30, 60, 100 fold. Just one person that you come to know, comes to know the Lord through you He's a Billy Graham, a great evangelist. You've received a hundred million full back. Do you understand that? That's how it works because you cannot count the number of apples in one seed. That's how it works. So when you sow, you sow sacrificially. And I remember sowing sacrificially. See, it will cost you time. Somebody say, it will cost you time. It will cost you effort. It will cost you money. It will cost you inconvenience. But we all have the same amount of time. Yeah, 24 hours is 24 hours, 24 hours. The clock of life, somebody said, is wound but once. And no one knows the hour. Just when those hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you have to do his perfect will. Don't wait for tomorrow, my friends, for your clock may then be still. Okay, you have 24 hours, I have 24 hours. What are you going to sow it for? Just for yourself? No, God gives you divine appointments and you just sow it. You know, we have the same time. One minute's a minute, right? Although sometimes, you know, one minute seems a long time. You know, somebody said, is one minute a long time? He says, it depends. Which side of the toilet door you're waiting on, you know, when you got diarrhea. You know, one minute can be a long time, even on the wrong side, and you got diarrhea. Okay? But, but one minute is a minute is a minute, you know what I mean? Yeah, you sow sacrificially. And uh, this is what I did. I, I, I sowed sacrificially to, uh, you know, there was a, I had an interior designer for my clinic. He designed my clinic. But he was a man with a, one of the most foul-tempered men in the city. I mean, he was so foul-tempered that uh, even the builders were afraid of him. And builders in my city, the contractors, they were tough people. They were really tough. You don't, they were real rednecks. You, know? you don't mess around with builders in, in, in Malaysia. You're, but they were terrified of this interior designer. And he had a foul temper. He gave them jobs and made sure they did it 101%. Otherwise, they won't get another job. So he was, he, was, he was a guy who was full of pride. And you know, I'd known him for so many years. And, and, and I brought him to so many meetings. Evangelistic meetings, church meetings, Christmas, Easter, you name it. Full gospel, businessmen, conference. He never gave his heart to the Lord. He just went because I invited him and he wanted to give me face. That's why he went. But he used to tell people, this Dr. Philip Lynn. <laughs> He thinks it's so easy to convert me. I'm, I'm just, I'm just doing, doing him a favor, that's all. Don't tell him that. I'm doing him a favor, that's all. And I knew that because friends could just come and tell me that. <laughs> but I, I just continued so sacrificially. Wasted a lot of my time, money for him. Then one day, he had a bad gastric ulcer, stomach ulcer, a severe pain. I treated him all types of medicine. He couldn't get better. And then one day, I was sitting with him at, at, at lunchtime. You know, he had a bad gastric He was hardly eating. He just ate porridge. And I said, what's wrong with you? He said, gastric I said, you know, I've given you everything that under the sun that I know and it still doesn't cure you. You know what? You know, Jesus can heal you. I just said it again. <gasps> I just said it. Jesus can heal you. So he said, so what, how can Jesus heal me? I said, I, I, let me pray for you, Johnny. Let me pray for you. He said, no, no, no. I, I, there are too many people in this restaurant. Everybody knows me in this town. Don't pray for me. I said, well, can I pray for you privately? He said, yeah, if you want to, come to my house uh, after work today and uh, pray for me there. He's got nothing to lose because, you know, he wants to get rid of his ulcer, it was bleeding. So after work, I went to his house. He had a, tiny, he had a studio. 
in the annex of his house. And he is a perfectionist. That's why he's such a good interior designer. He's a perfectionist. If you, everything must be perfect. When he designs everything, you must build everything to his specs. Even to the quarter of an inch. You must get it right. Okay, that's why he's such a good interior designer. But if you actually went to visit him, don't touch any of his things. The crystal vases, everything. Because if you lift up a crystal vase to look at it, make sure you put it back exactly the same spot. <laughs> Otherwise, he will just go berserk. Okay, he was such a good interior. That, that's why he brought so much stress upon himself and had the ulcers. Do you realize that? So I came to, to his annex uh, in his studio and I said, here I am. He said, oh, okay, pray for me. Now I know in his studio, everything is in perfect place. Everything is perfect place. Nothing is amiss in terms of arrangements. So I, I, I laid my hands on him. He sat, he sat there at the table and I came round to his table. I said, can I just pray for you? He said, okay. So I laid hands on his shoulder. I shut my eyes and I prayed. And as I prayed, the Holy Spirit came down and his shoulders started heaving up and down. And I opened my eyes. He was crying. He was, he was crying and I was, he was crying. I've never seen him cry before. It's one of the hardest nuts in town. And he said, I don't know why I'm crying. Oh, I didn't even cry when my dad died and my mom died. It's true. He never even shed a tear when his mom and, mom and dad died. I was at the funeral. He was saying, I don't know why I'm crying. Uh, then I said to him, do you know why you're crying, Johnny? You're crying because you've come home. Oh, he's going crying huh? <laughs> loudly. Uh, he was crying and all the snot was coming out you know what I mean all the gunch then he, 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 he reached for his box of tissues you must understand the box of tissues is always at the bottom right hand corner of the table always it's perfectly pierced there but this day the Holy Spirit smuggled it somewhere else so oh, he was crying for his box of tissues oh, there was not nowhere to be found oh, he was crying all around and then you know it was all gunching coming out it was, it was hideous and then he lifted up his sleeves and they went and did that but who cares? He gave his heart to Jesus that day. It was one of the hardest nuts in town. And then this is how the multiplication took place. Because when he went back to his site with all the building projects that he had, he was an interior designer. He would ask the builders and some of their people, have you received Jesus? <laughs> they said, no, you come with me to church on Sunday. Okay, you. <laughs> Many of them up to today came to know the Lord through him. See, one seed, number of apples, I can't count. So when you sow sacrificially, this happens. And uh, here's the final thing. You sow together. Everybody say sow together. Yeah. Everybody say sow simply. Yeah. Sow faithfully. Yeah. Say sow sacrificially. Yeah. Give each other a high five and, and hold each other's hand and say sow together. Yeah. Okay, sow together. We are sowing together. And this is what this church must do. Heartbeat, you must sow together. Come and say amen. amen. When somebody brings in the friend, you receive the friend. Make sure you welcome the friend. Don't say, well, that, that guy is, is, is uh, you know, Daniel's friend. So let Daniel look after the friend. No. Daniel comes in, he must count on 20 of you to surround him. And then he can walk away and have a coffee on his own. You guys look after him. <laughs> his friend. And then the, this friend who comes in knows that he's really loved. He's really cared for. That's what it means by sewing together. Do you understand what I mean? And, and, and when we sew together like that, it, it, it's very powerful. Now, the, 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 the sower in uh, the harvest, uh, it is not in the story of the, the, uh, the, uh, the sower and the seed, but John chapter 4 verse 36 tells us this, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Because I will tell you this, sometimes you sow, somebody else has reap. Is that okay? Is that okay? Sometimes somebody else sows and you reap. Is that okay? Okay. Sometimes somebody from another church sows and this church reaps. Can somebody say amen? Sometimes you sow and another church reap. Is that okay? We sow together. Okay, although the, the, second, the second okay was softer than the first, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> and, but, you know, we sow together. Turn to your neighbor one more time and say, we sow together. We together. And that's one of the greatest joys to see a church doing that. You're sowing together. The moment you a new person comes in or a stranger comes in, you surround him. It's not just because he's Daniel's friend or Kevin's friend or, or what, who, whoever's friends, it's, you know, it's... It's, this is somebody to win for the Lord. So we just surround him with love. We connect with him. Help him in any way he can. And he knows, and he says, wow, this is an incredible church. It's a warm church. It's genuine. It's full of God's love. It's, I've never felt received like that before. And you sow together. And, and as you sow together, beautiful things begin to happen. One brings, another welcomes. One introduces, another befriends. One sows, another reap. And we do it together. Somebody say it, Together! Okay, here are the four ways in which we sow, so, okay? 
Firstly, I will say the first one is so simply. Okay. The second one is? So faithfully. Okay. Third one is? That's great. And the final one is? That's great. Turn to your neighbor and just give them a high five and say, you got it. Can I have the musicians up? Can I have the musicians up right now? I'm going to close right now. You have the musicians up. Okay. Can I have the musicians up. I'll tell you a story about sewing together, right? As I close now. So that you will, you will be sewing together as well. As musicians just come up. I've just got one final slide, okay? And uh, this, is, this, is, this is what's happened. Because like in Skyline Church, we learned this principle of sewing together. One brings, another befriends, you know, one welcomes and another share the gospel. We do do it, sometimes coffee time. My goodness, not many people will come to a church, you understand? So by the time they come into a church, they are already type A pre-believers. There are two types of pre-believers. The B or C B believers who will never come into a church, who will never want to know about religion, especially the type C. And the type B are quite hard. But when a person opens himself to come into the church, the service, he is already a type A pre-believer. Do you understand that? I mean, there's a good chance, more than 50, 60, 70% chance it's ready for somebody to share the gospel. Do you understand that? So when you're having coffee, you share the gospel. In one minute. By the way, has anybody told you, God loves you? That's the story of the gospel. No? Well, can, can, can I just take one minute to just tell you? You begin. And many people have come to know the Lord during coffee time. In Skyline. And I believe heartbeat too. Somebody say amen. Amen. Your coffee time is evangelism time. Let's say have refreshments with you. Because they re-step into church, which means they must be open to the gospel already. More likely than not. But I tell you, when you have this whole habit of sowing and reaping together, God will surprise you. And it was what happened in, in you know, about seven, eight years ago in Skyline. You know, when the church was manageable in terms of size, I used to stand at the door and greet people. Welcome to Skyline. Oh, great to see you, Daryl, this week. Oh, great to see you, James. Oh, great to see you, uh, Susie. It's, it's great to see you. I, I could still remember the names of the people, you know, in those early days. Now I don't stand at the door too much because half the names I can't remember. Church is too big. I, I don't know who they are. <laughs> I, you know, I'm quite terrified. I will ask them stupid questions like, and have you been, are you, are you new? They said, Pastor, we've been here for three years. I know. <laughs> So I don't stand at the door so much anymore. But in those early days, I used to stand at the door and greet people. Then one day, something happened. You know, in my town is, is an Indian man who owns one of the most famous curry houses in town. How many of you like curry and Indian food? I, I love it. One of the best. You come to KK, look me up, I'll take you to famous curry head. You know, curry fish head. Curry fish head. It's a beautiful Malaysian dish, curry fish head. Beautiful curry. He owns one of the most, the biggest and the most famous curry fish head in town. He was a pre-believer. He was Indian. He had a lot of Hindu this and that. And uh, he, he married, his, his wife was a backslidden Roman Catholic when he married her. And the wife never ever went to church. But the whole, they were very successful in town. But the whole family was going downwards. Their kids who had grown up to be quite big-sized, burly guys. You know, they were in their, you know, late teens and early twenties. They're getting in a gang fight. And instead of going to you, do you, a uni, they were actually drop out from schools. So the whole family was big, going on downward spirals, cracking up. And you know, one day the wife said, I don't know what to do. I, 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 I don't know what to do. I just need God's help. She'd never been to church in all her marriage, 20 years. And she decided she was going to go back to church. The only church she knew was a Roman Catholic church because she was a backslidden Roman Catholic. And she, she said to the husband, Krishna was the name of the husband, Krishna. You know, like the Indian God, Krishna. So he says, Krishna, are you coming with me? Krishna said, I, I don't go to church. You know that. You know, I don't believe in this stuff. But okay, if you're not coming, I'll, I'll go my own. Oh, by the way, Krishna said, maybe I'll come with you. But I'll only come with you to church if you go to Skyline Church. Now, don't get me wrong. He has never been to our church. He just heard he was in the hotel. He has never known anything about church. He doesn't know. He just picked out a hat somewhere. Skyline Church. So the wife said, okay. I don't know about Skyline Church. I've never been there, but if you want to go, I'll go with you. At least two of us go to church. So they came to church that day, looking really down because there were such huge challenges to their family. They were depressed. They were down. They don't know how to solve their problems with their kids, getting into gang, gangsterism and gang fights and family was breaking up. They were shouting and arguing in the household. And as you walk up the steps, you know, you have to come up to, to Skyline Church. We are on the third floor of a five-star hotel, by the way, okay? 
Pastor Josh will tell you, we're in a store. And when you look out of, of the balcony of our church, you see five star swimming pools. We are, we, have, we are blessed by God to be there. Okay. We've been there for the last 16 years. Blessed by God. And so I was shaking the door, shaking uh, hands at the door of the church. And he was walking up the spiral, grand spiral staircase to come up to church. And as I was shaking hands, I looked around and I saw that Indian man coming up. But you must understand, I don't have good eyesight. I'm a little bit short-sighted. But all of you are okay, you could hear enough, okay? So I can see your, your face. But I couldn't see, I look at an Indian man, they're coming up with a bald head. I thought, that is my pastor friend. Oh my goodness, my pastor friend's coming to visit me. I didn't know it was Krishna Curry House guy. Do you understand? It's my pastor friend, oh my goodness. He's coming all the way from West Malaysia to visit me. You know, I stopped shaking, I, was I ran out to him as you're coming up the spiral staircase towards the landing. I didn't shout his name, but I ran out, hello, welcome. I said to him, come on, welcome. I ran out my hands, you know, outstretched to, to hug him. And as I came close to him, I was like, oh my God, it's not my, it's not my friend. <laughs> It's Krishna from Curry House. I know him because his Curry House is very famous. It's Krishna from Curry House. But my, I, I hardly know him. But my arms already were outstretched. My smile was there, so I fixed it. <laughs> Hello. Great to see you, Krishna. And I began to hug him. I began to hug him. As I hugged him, something changed in his heart. That day, I was preaching. He gave his heart to the Lord together with his wife. They gave their hearts to Jesus. And uh, they have grown in our church ever since. Now he's in his curry house, he tells people about Jesus. It's both, and God turned his family around. His, both his kids went to uni eventually and graduated tops in uni. The family has come together. He's now he's got grandchildren. The family's doing really well. God saved the family. But I didn't know the story from his side. I told you the story from his side up to that point on the staircase. As he was walking up the staircase, one day I asked him, Krishna, will you come and share your testimony? So he stood in front of the church and shared his testimony. And this is what he said. He said, according to what I tell you, all the thing was true, but here's from his point as he was walking up the spiral staircase towards Skyline. He said, I didn't know why I came to Skyline. I had no idea what this church was all about. I, as I walked up, I just cried out to if there was a God. I said, God, if there's, that you are there, God, you know, I need help. I don't know what to do, you know, about my family and my kids. As he was walking up, totally despondent, he looked up and he saw I was running towards him. My arms outstretched. And then before he knew it, as came to the landing, I had hugged him. He said, I felt as if Jesus was hugging me that day. And he gave his heart to Jesus. He said, how, God, how did you know? How did you know? As soon as he shared that to the church, that, you know, it's two years later, you know, in that testimony. That's the first time I've heard it. And I was sitting down there listening. Oh my God, I thought to myself, shall I tell him the truth? <laughs> So after he went down, the church was really moved by his testimony. I stood up and said, I will tell you, I have a confession to make. Krishna, I really have a confession to make. That day when you're walking up the staircase, I thought you were my pastor friend from West Malaysia. That's why I ran out to you. I didn't know it was you. I didn't know it was you. My eyes were so bad, I thought, you're my pastor friend. But when I came with my arms, I was straight, it was too late, Krishna. I didn't know what else to do. So it wasn't like 100% genuine, you know. I mean, I just hug you, you know, welcome. It was not 100% genuine because, you know, I just, it was a mistaken identity. And at that moment, the church went silent. Instead of just, just laughing and seeing like, just, you know, I'm pastor, you know. They knew it was the hand of God. They just knew. It was the hand of God. Only God can orchestrate and engineer something like that. Can somebody say amen to that? And that's how he came to know the Lord. And now one seed now sows many seeds. His relatives, his friends, my goodness, all the high and mighty people come to his curry house and they hear the gospel. Because he shares what God has done in his life. And that's why when you sow like that, God can bring people to know him. To know him. And I just want to say this as you do so, yeah, that do not in any way as, uh, do not in any way lose heart with what God can do for your life. How many of you want to share the gospel and win somebody to Jesus? Can I see your hands? You, if you believe that, stand up with me. Stand up right now on your feet right now. I'm going to ask for a commitment today, okay? Today you believe that God can do you. You say, God, I want you to use me. Then I want you to pray this simple prayer with me today. 
I want you to open your hearts, lift up your hands right now. And I want you to say this prayer loud. Pray it aloud in your heart. Pray it after me right now in your heart. Aloud. Say, Lord Jesus. Say it aloud. Pray it aloud. So that your spirit hear it. Say, say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that no one comes to God the Father except through you. And today, Lord, I surrender my heart to you. I ask you, Lord, to use me for your glory. That today, by faith, I'm going to believe as I trust in you that I will lead at least one person to come to know you. Not by power, not by might, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name, come and give me, O God. Come and give me the fresh anointing. I surrender my heart to you. In Jesus' name. If that is your prayer and you mean what you say before God, I want you to step out of the seat and come right out to the front. Because we're going to make a, a commitment to the Lord tonight. Even as you come to the last of this kind of meeting, before you start heartbeat in a different way next week, you come out and stand out right here in the front. Because if that's your commitment to the Lord, then this is your commitment before the Lord. Okay? You stand right here in the front because I want you to just pray a final prayer for all of you before I dismiss you today. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come right out to the front. Take a few steps more ahead so that people at the back can just have space to stand. And I ask the musicians to pray, play something, sing something in the name of Jesus. <laughs>